Our regular newsletter, number 17, is now ready, and I'll tell you about that at the end of the programme. I have still been having a lot of letters about that very brilliant object that's been visible in the western sky after sunset. That was, in fact, the planet Venus. You won't see it just now. It's almost between us and the sun. But in the very near future, it will again be visible, this time in the eastern sky before dawn, and again very brilliant, because Venus is always much brighter than any other star or planet. In point of fact, the evening sky at the moment is rather short on planets, so uh, let's have a look at a sky map. We begin, as you so often do, with Ursa Major, the great bear of the plough, whichever you call it, now almost overhead. And high in the south, you can see Leo, the lion, with the bright star Regulus. If you follow around the curve of the great bear, you will come to a lovely light orange star, Arcturus, which is very brilliant indeed. And if you continue that line still further, you will come to the white first magnitude star, Spica, in Virgo, the Virgin. And the planet Saturn is not very far from Spica, actually just over the borders of Libra, the balance. Well, to the naked eye, Saturn looks like an ordinary bright star. But if you have a telescope, I suggest you look at it, because the rings are now wide open, and I always feel that Saturn is the loveliest thing in the entire sky. But now for something entirely different. In January 1983, IRS, the infrared astronomical satellite, was launched, and there's a laboratory picture of it. In fact, that was put into a path around the Earth, but about 900 kilometres, and there's an artist's impression of IRS going round. And it was put into a very special kind of orbit because it was desired to keep it in sunlight for nearly all the time. And as you can see from this model, IRS is going round just about at the border between the daylit and the night hemispheres, and so it can operate for nearly all the time. But of course, it does itself send out infrared radiation, and so the instruments have to be cooled they have to be cooled down to minus 260 degrees centigrade, and that's very cold indeed. Infrared is what we normally call heat, and the best illustration I can give is to ask you to imagine what happens when you turn on an electric fire. You'll feel the infrared well before the bars become hot enough to glow in optical light. And uh, we've got an experiment here to show you what I mean. Here we have a perfectly ordinary electric fire. And on the right of the picture, we have an equally ordinary television camera, which corresponds to your optical telescope. And that little grey box is an infrared camera. Now, if we switch on the fire, you will see, first of all, that the infrared camera records it. And it's some time before the bars become hot enough to glow in visible light, and we get them with the ordinary television camera. Now, in fact, uh, infrared is part of, the, in part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum and visible light is only a very small part of that. Here I've got a diagram to show what I mean. It's not to scale, but that doesn't really matter. We have visible light in the middle, and to the short wave end, to the left, we have ultraviolet, and then X-rays, and then the very short, very penetrative gamma rays. And over to the right-hand side, we have infrared, and then the much longer radio waves. And IRS operated between 10 thousandths and 100 thousandths of a millimetre in wavelength. Actually, at 12, uh, 25, 60, and 100 thousandths of a millimetre. Well, we've already done two programmes about IRS. We were there when it was actually launched, and we've done one programme since then. But in fact, we now have a lot of exciting new information. And we are delighted to welcome back once again someone who's been very closely involved in the programme all the way through, uh, Dr Jim Emerson of Queen Mary College. Welcome back, Jim. It's fair to say, isn't it, that IRS has been an outstanding success? Well, it's been successful really beyond our, our wildest dreams. We've discovered about a quarter of a million new objects. We've discovered many new galaxies. We've discovered much about how galaxies, stars and even planets form and how they evolve. And even better than this, we've managed to get images of the sky uh, to, 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 a, to an accuracy that we really hadn't expected at all. Perhaps we can illustrate this best by a photograph, an optical photograph of the Large Magellanic Cloud, the nearest galaxy to us. Here's the optical picture taken with the Anglo-Australian Telescope. We can compare this with the infrared picture obtained by RS, which looks very different. And this is, in fact, a characteristic and one of the reasons why we did the RS survey, because the sky looks very different in the infrared. Well, there are all kinds of infrared sources in the sky. What exactly are they? Well, indeed, many, many different kinds. Uh, perhaps the best way to explain this is to just show a map of them. Uh, here we see a map of all the objects that RS discovered plotted on the, um, the sky. The bluer objects are the hotter ones. The things that look red are colder, the yellow and green somewhere in between. We see running along horizontally along the middle of the picture the plane of the galaxy. 
And in this picture, we see both galaxies, stars, regions of star formation in our galaxy, and Cirrus. But perhaps it's easier to see the distinction between these on separate maps. So perhaps if first we just look at a map of the stars, these are the stars, and they lie very much concentrated in the plane of our galaxy. I should, by the way, just explain that the two kind of white streaks missing uh, at the left and right-hand parts of the plane of our galaxy are just regions of sky that Iris didn't cover. Then if we look at galaxies and regions of star formation, we see a rather different looking picture of the sky. Here, running along the plane of the galaxy, horizontally on the figure again, is regions of star formation in our galaxy. But if we look above that, up towards the poles of the galaxy, here we look up towards the North Pole, say, we see a rather uniform distribution of sources over the whole sky, and these are the galaxies. Another thing we found over the, almost the whole sky was this phenomenon called interstellar cirrus. This is somewhat concentrated towards the galactic plane, but found most places, and this is dust floating around between the stars. Well, shall we start with our own solar system? And um, IRS paid quite a lot of attention to comets. There's one faint periodical comet, Tempel 2, which we found to have a dust tail. Now, that is an artist's impression by Paul Doherty. You can't actually see the dust tail in visible light, but it was detected by IRS. And IRS itself discovered half a dozen new comets, including IRS Araki Alcock, and this photograph was taken at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, discovered simultaneously by IRS, by our own George Alcock, and by Araki in Japan. And then there was a curious little asteroid or minor planet that goes within nine million miles of the sun, so it must be very hot indeed. But I think some of the most interesting discoveries related to those dust belts in the solar system. They were quite unexpected. Yes, well, we were expecting to find dust in the plane of our solar system, in the orbit of the planets around the sun, and we did, and indeed you see it on this picture, the blue band of emission a, a cor running horizontally across the picture. By the way, here we see the galactic plane running at sort of 45 degrees on the left and the right of the picture here, we're looking at the sky from a different angle here, so it looks rather different. We also found, and this is what was totally unexpected, two further bands of dust emission about 10 degrees above and below the central one. You can't see them very well on this picture, so perhaps if we highlight them, we can see rather more clearly where they are. This was, as I say, totally unexpected, and it seems that it's material at about the distance of the asteroid belts from us and extending almost the distance of the Earth from the Sun above and below the plane of the solar system. And this seems to be dust in an orbit inclined at about 10 degrees to the plane of the solar system. Perhaps the dust got into this orbit due to some collision between a comet and an asteroid. I wonder, what about Planet 10? Well, we've been looking for Planet 10, but I'm afraid we haven't found it yet. But well, we'll keep looking. Perhaps we will. Now, going out beyond the solar system, I think that something that really caught everybody's imagination was the revelation that some stars, including the brilliant blue Vega, are associated with cool material which just could be planet forming. Now, this again is an artist's impression. I just wonder whether the system of Vega does look like that if you're close to it. But over 40 stars were detected in this way, and one of them was the southern Beta Pictoris, in the little constellation of the painter that you can't see from here, and uh, that uh, material has now been detected optically with the big telescopes in Chile. Very interesting indeed. Jim, do you think there are any planets there? Well, uh, perhaps I'll answer that in two ways. First is to say that IRAS, what IRAS found was dust that seems to be growing in size and is probably going to grow into planets. Now, Iris didn't actually directly see a planet, so I can't say for sure that there are any planets, but on the other hand, statistically speaking, in at least one of these, it's pretty likely there really is a planet. I would certainly think there is. Now, let's go into far space. The infrared sky looks very different from the optical sky. Why exactly is that? Well, perhaps if we just look at a picture of what the optical sky looks like, uh, here we see the whole sky optically. Again, we have the plane of our galaxy running horizontally across the picture. We're seeing the starlight, Basically, starlight is objects, uh, heat coming, light coming from objects of a few thousand degrees centigrade. After all, we evolved so that our eyes would be sensitive to light from the sun, which is 7,500 degrees centigrade. The other thing that dominates the appearance of this picture is that there is dust in space in between the stars and us, and this accounts for some of the blank patches on this picture. If we look at the infrared picture of the sky, in fact, this is unaffected by dust. The dust doesn't obscure the infrared light, uh, and we can see right throughout the galaxy um, and in particular, we will tend to see co much cooler objects in the infrared, objects of temperatures minus 250 to zero degrees centigrade, uh, so cool stars, and also dust around various stars just radiating its own heat. If our eyes were sensitive to infrared rather than ordinary light, what would the brightest things be? Well, it would, of course, depend on what s wavelength of infrared light we were sensitive to, but let's suppose it was the shortest wavelength that Iris looked at, 12 microns, 
there we'd find that the brightest sources on the sky were all rather cool stars. Uh, these would be uh, old stars in rather late stages of their evolution. Some of them would just be ordinary stars. Others would be stars with dust shells around them, and it would be the radiation from the dust shells that was producing the infrared. In fact, one of the important things that Iris has done is to do a survey of the sky, do an unbiased count of all the different kinds of objects that are there. And by counting up the relative numbers of different types of objects, we can actually deduce the relative, eight, the relative times that, ob that stars spend in these various stages and compare these with our theories of stellar evolution and indeed galaxy evolution. And this is a very important thing. What about the shape of our galaxy in infrared? Well, as I mentioned before, the lack of obscuration by dust in the infrared makes it an ideal way to look at the galaxy. And if we look, select objects with temperatures 100 degrees or so either side of room temperature, we find that they define very nicely the plane of our galaxy and also show something that had been deduced rather indirectly for a long time, that there's a bulge in the center of our galaxy. And we see this bulge very nicely in these cool stars. Well, of course, all this is telling us a great deal more about stellar evolution, is it not? Yes, indeed. And also, Iris tells us a great deal about the young stages of stellar evolution, particularly if our eyes were sensitive to a wavelength of a hundred thousandths of a millimeter instead of 12, uh, which is what I hypothesized before, we'd see mostly regions of star formation. In fact, if we look at the region, the Taurus Perseus region of the sky with an Iris image, we'll see over on the bottom left of the picture a number of protostars, stars in the process of formation. Uh, these, in fact, probably even have perhaps protoplanetary systems around them that are involved in flows of material away from these young stars. Now, also in this picture, we see just slightly to the right of the center, the Pleiades, the bright young cluster of stars, and up somewhat to the north, some nebulae. Now, Iris sees a lot of nebulae. Uh, these are generally regions where younger, hotter stars have formed. There's the Rofucus Nebula, for instance, that is seen here in the middle of the picture. That little bright thing running across the bottom right-hand corner of the picture is the galactic plane. Rofucus contains some young stars that are newly formed, embedded in dust clouds, and also shining somewhat by reflection. And it looks a bit like a spider in this picture, perhaps. Another well-known nebula that Iris sees very well is Orion. Orion is the bottom uh, object more or less in the center here and we see various other regions of active star formation in the galaxy. Also we see reflection nebulae, in particular this green object here uh, is dust around the star Alpha Cam. It's probably not a star that's all that recently formed but this is a rather unique image in the IRS database of this reflection nebulosity around Alpha Cam. The blue dots are hotter stars and the green ones more to the right uh, are somewhat cooler objects. We also, if we look in, say, Ursa Major region, we see great regions of nebulosity. Uh, it's not quite clear exactly what these are yet, and, and we're investigating them. Also, we have the case of windswept nebulae, such as the one known as RCW 58. This is around a kind of star called a wolf ray star, which has a, a wind, and the wind from this star sweeps up circumstellar material. And on the left there, you see the optical picture, and on the right, the heat from the swept-up dust shell. Well, when we come to all sky pictures, we come across this strange stuff that seems to have become known now as interstellar cirrus. What exactly is it, Jim? Well, here's a picture, in fact, looking right towards the north celestial pole of some of this interstellar cirrus. And it's so called because it looks a bit like clouds on, in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it's dust floating around between the stars. Uh, it was unexpected that there would be so much of it or that we'd see it so well. Uh, the fact that it's dust floating around is understood, but what we don't understand is why a lot of it is so very hot. We would expect it to be hot close to a star, but further away from a star, we'd expect it to be much cooler. Well, it isn't. It's very hot. Uh, one possibility may be the dust grains are much smaller than we'd expected, and so when a certain amount of heat comes and heats up a small dust grain, it will get hotter than the same amount of heat in a big dust grain. Rather like if you heated up a tumbler of water, it would get the same amount of heat would raise that temperature much higher than if, if you use the same amount of heat to heat a bath full of water. When we last talked on the sky at night, Jim, there were various infrared sources that Iris had detected that didn't seem to correspond with anything at all. They were blank fields. Have you solved that problem now? Yes, well, people have been off and used various electronic detectors on telescopes to probe these regions rather more deeply than we've been able to do with optical photographs before. And in the center of all these regions, and here you see one right in the center of that box, you see nothing on this optical photograph. With these electronic detectors, we now found galaxies in the center of almost all these fields. And here is, is one example. Now, these galaxies are found to be extremely luminous, and very often they show some evidence of being slightly perturbed. This, for instance, doesn't look like a normal spiral or elliptical galaxy. It looks a bit, a bit strange. 
there are two explanations for why these objects are so luminous. They seem to be millions and millions of solar luminosities. One possibility is they are starbursts, great bursts of star formation going on. Another, that there is an active galactic nucleus embedded in dust. These things are sometimes known as safe at galaxies. Safe at the strange things. Uh, using my telescope, I had a look at one the other night, Messier 77, and there it is. Uh, safe have got small, relatively small, condensed nuclei, and only weak spiral arms. And they are very luminous indeed, and probably very active. I think they've even been described as mini quasars. Yes, well indeed, that's right. They're thought probably to have black holes in the middle, and one of the things we want to try and understand is whether all galaxies go through a safe at phase, or just some of them. And one clue in this has been dis found with a new object that Iris has discovered. Uh, from the infrared survey, we found this object, and when we took a photograph of it, it looked more or less like an ordinary spiral galaxy. Optical spectra showed it had a safe at nucleus, and one would expect then, if one made a radio map, that you have a small, compact radio source in the middle, rather like illustrated in this diagram. Well, we went to the telescope and actually took a radio map of the object, and it was totally different from that. It showed two giant lobes of emission either side of the galaxy. This is something that's far more normally associated with an elliptical galaxy. And so perhaps there's some kind of intermediate stage here between the elliptical galaxies with giant radio lobes and the spiral galaxies that generally don't have them. So this may be a clue as to what's going on in CFIT galaxies. Is that the only one of its kind so far? No, there are several, a couple like this, but not many. Now, what about that strange thing, ARP-220? Well, ARP-220 is a uh, case of one of these starburst galaxies. Optically, it looks like a rather disturbed thing. Uh, here we see this optical picture with the RS error box in the middle, and drawn within it, somewhat to the left of that central oval, is the position of the radio continuum center of the object, which is probably the real center of the galaxy. The shape of the thing is partly affected by dust obscuration, but it also shows some evidence of being an interacting system. It's thought there's a giant burst of star formation going on here, rather like in the galaxy M82, except there's about 100 times more material involved in ARP-220. Uh, it's thought that this star formation has probably been triggered by an interaction. Many galaxies seem to be interacting. Here's an example of ARP-243, uh, known as the antennae, two galaxies that seem to be colliding with each other. And it may well be that these collisions produce episodic star formation in galaxies, and this new discovery that the galaxies do not stay the same, they go through intense bursts of star formation, is a very important thing. Well, RS has now come to the end of its career. It's still going around the world, of course, and will go around for a long time yet, but its power has given out. Jim, if you had to make one choice, what would you say was the greatest achievement of RS? Well, I think I'm going to slightly dodge the question and say, at the moment, it's probably the thing that discovering the protoplanetary systems around Vega, but I think in the long term, it will be more the statistical information we get on how stars and galaxies evolve. And what comes next? RS is dead. Are there any more satellites planned of the same kind? Yes, the European Space Agency has a satellite called the Infrared Space Observatory that's due to look for launch in some seven or eight years' time and that's going ahead at the moment. So, in fact, there's plenty to be learned on the infrared sky and of course it will still take a long time before you get all the results back from RS. Oh, certainly. And there's a lot of people who are spending a lot of time on telescopes all around the world now following up the RS data and it's really only from all this follow-up that we'll get the full harvest of the RS. Well, it's all going to be very interesting. Jim, thank you very much, and I have no doubt that in the near future we have a lot more to say about the infrared sky. Now, uh, when I started this program, I said I would tell you about our newsletter, and we have it ready now, number 17. And if you want it, send the stamped address envelope to newsletter number 17, the sky at night, BBC television, London, W12, 8QT. And please bear in mind, you really must send the stamped address envelope, otherwise I'm afraid we can't send you a newsletter. Now, by a piece of bad timing, there's going to be an eclipse of the moon on May the 4th, and that's one day before we do our next program, so I can't tell you about it nearer the time. But in fact, uh, from Britain, the moon rises eclipsed, either totally or partially, depending upon where you are, and we're not going to have a very good view of it, but uh, there is going to be a very much better eclipse of the moon in October, and I will say more about it then. And finally, Voyager 2 is on its way to the planet Uranus. It's due to pass that planet in January next year, and of course we'll be bringing you news of it. But it has already started taking pictures, which are better than any of those obtained from Earth, and we'll show you those as soon as we can. So for the moment, from Jim and from myself, good night. <laughs>